Um, hello guys, welcome back to Bridging the Gap. And so today's talk is going to be on stroke. So we're starting, I think we've already started um, our series on neurology, uh, gastro and respiratory. So we're doing a mix and today's talk will be on stroke by um, Dr. Janvi Yadav, who is a uh, FY2 doctor um, working in northwest of London. Um, and as usual, we'll try and make it as interactive as possible. So if you guys can type your answers in the chat and feel free to rename yourselves. Um, just, yeah, and um, yeah, by uh, towards the end of the session, we'll try, uh, we'll post the feedback forms and uh, where you can get a certificate of attendance if you fill it in and also a copy of the slides. And I think that's it. I'll just hand it over to um, Janvi. All right, thank you so much. Hi guys, my name's John V, as Julie said. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about stroke. So the following presentation, it's just a very um, brief summary of stroke. And it's the topic itself is quite broad and there's a lot of specialist input that stroke requires. So this is just the basics of what um, you as medical students in potentially final years um, should know for exams. Uh, but be wary that um, whenever you've got a stroke coming in, when you guys are F1s and F2s working in ED, always, always, always get the specialists in immediately because it's too complicated for you to be dealing on your own. Um, just a little bit about me. My name's Dr. Janvi Yadav. I'm an F2. I'm currently working on ITU. So there's quite a few um, stroke patients who come up to us requiring intubation and ventilation. Um, I'm interested myself in anesthetics and surgery. Uh, I'm a bit conflicted between the two ever since I started on ITU. Um, I'm an Imperial clinical supervisor. So Imperial students who are part of our hospital trust. I am clinical supervisor and mentor to about five of them. So I have a bit of teaching experience, but I was also um, a MedSoc coordinator and teacher back at university um, when I was studying in Nottingham. So uh, a bit of teaching experience has shown me, as Julie said, that, you know, learning is best when it's interactive so please throughout the following presentation try and answer as many as the mcqs as you can just answer in the chat box um there's no judgment this is a learning environment um so please do do try and reply all right so what are we going to cover today we have a clinical case that we're going to start with um and throughout that case there'll be a few questions regarding the clinical presentation and what you guys think uh, we'll then move on to talk about the blood supply to the brain which is very important in strokes obviously um, and how that blood supply then correlates to how strokes are classified so um, this talk's only be going to be covering the bamford classification of strokes so the total anterior partial anterior posterior strokes it's the basic classification um, and then we'll talk about the treatment of strokes and then at the end we have about five multiple choice questions that cover the whole topic that are very general um, and are taken from med school finals so good a good learning experience without further ado let's go straight into it so the clinical case is of a patient who was brought in by ambulance. He's a 65 year old gentleman who had sudden onset weakness in his arm and legs with the slurring of his speech. His wife noticed a facial droop as well and called 111. He's got a past medical history of hypertension and cholesterolemia for which he takes amlodipine and atorvastatin once a day. He's an ex-smoker, let's say he quit about five years ago, and smokes, or used to smoke, 10, pack, 10 cigarettes a day for 30 years. So he's got a pack year of about 15 years. On examination, 
this is what you see. So cranial nerves, he's got a very subtle facial droop on the right hand side and his facial movements are asymmetrical with an eyebrow raise that's normal. He does also have slight uvular deviation to the right hand side. Then you move on to his upper limbs. So the neurology of the upper limbs is as follows. You see that his arm on the right is curled up as so in the picture. He's hypertonic and he's got a power of three out of five proximally, so around the upper arm, and is a little stronger distally um, around the lower arm. His reflexes are quite strong, so he's hyperreflexic, but his coordination is intact and his left arm is completely normal. So right now we're thinking, okay, this man's got very obvious right-sided symptoms. We're thinking this lesion's probably on the left. But then we go down to his lower limbs and we see actually the right side is now normal and it's the left side, the left leg, that's hypertonic with clonus and hyperreflexic. His Babinski sign positive, so his toes curl upwards, and his coordination is impaired. So hopefully you've all recognized that of course this is a stroke given the topic of this presentation, but also I think his symptoms are very, very obvious um, and we're worried. At this point, where are we thinking is the problem? Anybody in the chat, please try and input your thoughts. And if, if we're if not answering the question, just what do you think um, in general about this case? We've got one side symptoms in the upper arms, and then we've got on the other side down in the legs. So left in the left hemisphere. All right, I, I can see why you guys are thinking this, but remember that on his legs, the symptoms are on the opposite side to the symptoms in the arms. So we're not actually thinking left or right at this point because we've got bilateral changes. Anybody? Yep, so it is either anterior or posterior, correct? And if we're thinking about strokes and the classification of strokes, when you have bilateral symptoms, left and right, you're thinking posterior, okay? And we'll come into this a little bit later. This is just a little bit of a taster and to get our brains thinking about strokes. We will come into the classifications, don't worry. So just to remind you, when you have bilateral symptoms, so if you've got weakness in the left arm, as well as weakness in the right leg, you're not thinking about right or left anymore. You're thinking, okay, this is bilateral. It must be posterior, either the cerebellum or the midbrain or the pons. You're thinking posterior, okay? It's an important concept. Now, this is his CT which shows serial changes. So this is the um, one on the left is the initial CT, which if I can convince you doesn't really show a lot because um, in strokes, your imaging is often evolving and initially they, it can be quite unconvincing. But there is a little bit of um, shadowing in the posterior area down here. And then three hours later, this is very obvious abnormal brain tissue that brain's not happy and then later on the brain is starting to heal itself and recover and the the infarct is smaller so this is a posterior stroke that he's had what do we think is this hemorrhagic or is it ischemic in nature just looking at the images yep Rishab, very good so if this is an ischemic stroke, as are most strokes, correct? And the way that you can tell is by the color of, of the lesion. So a hemorrhagic stroke would 
really show up as white um near white and an ischemic stroke as such turns out darker than the actual brain tissue so brain tissue is light gray and when it's dead and it's lacking that blood supply and it's lacking the um, cell activity it turns a darker color on the ct okay so this is an ischemic stroke that he's had interestingly what is the significance of him having a normal eyebrow raise so i'm sure you have heard about the concept of um, central versus peripheral and forehead sparing versus forehead um, including what's the significance of that can we remember Okay, so it is a bit difficult. Yes, exactly. So Rishabh and Aditola, well done. Um, when you have um, a normal eyebrow raise, when your forehead is spared, it shows that your lesion is central. So it's an upper motor neuron lesion rather than a peripheral lesion. All right, we've got a diagram um, later on to show you. Um, but why is it that the forehead is spared in an upper motor, upper motor neuron lesion? This is more complicated now, but we'll explain it. Yes, very good. And thank you for being so well um, engaged and interactive. Exactly. So the facial nerve is innervated by ipsilateral and contralateral fibers from the motor cortex. So if we look at this diagram, comparing a peripheral versus a central lesion, on the left hand side, you can see that the upper muscles of the face and the lower muscles of the face are both supplied by the facial nerve. However, the fibers are split. Now the bottom half of the face is supplied by the other side or is innervated by a nerve that goes only contralaterally. Whereas the upper side, the upper muscles of the face are innervated with ipsilateral and contralateral innervation. So the upper muscles, such as the forehead, have both the same side and the opposite side innervation. So coming onto the diagram on the right, for example, if you have a stroke up here on the, what side is that? That's the left-hand side of the patient. There, they won't have any function in the lower, lower bit of their face because the strokes affected them. However, they have um, a contralateral innervation from the other side of the face preserving that forehead. Okay, so with a stroke, when you have facial features of a stroke, you will have the forehead spared. So they will be able to raise their eyebrows a little bit. Whereas if you've got Bell's a patient with Bell's palsy or Ramsey Hunt, for example, they will not be able to raise that eyebrow. So it's a very key part of an examination to differentiate between a stroke and something less sinister that's going to worry you a little bit less. Okay, so always look at the cranial nerves and the facial examination. Now, moving on to the blood supply of the brain, we have two very important diagrams. Let's start on the right hand side. So, and we'll start from the bottom as well, going upwards. So you have your vertebral arteries that come up and are running on either side of the neck, coming from your carotids that merge together and form your basilar artery that then has several branches coming out of it. 
um, supplying both the vertebral bodies as well as parts of the pons. And then it comes up and it splits into your posterior cerebral artery as well as your posterior communicating that comes up. And then off the internal carotids comes the middle cerebral, so the MCA, which is probably one of the most important arteries of the brain. And then coming forward, you have your anterior cerebral artery, so the ACA. And now the most important, those are the most important ones that I've just spoken about. But then you also have your cerebellar arteries. So you have your posterior inferior, you have your anterior inferior, as well as your superior cerebellar arteries. So three main arteries of the cerebellum. And they are in purple on the right hand side. And then your ACA, your PCA and your MCA are in green. Now that circle of Willis is important when you're thinking about um, which areas are supplied by what. And then that correlates to the image on the left. So looking at the lateral view, the majority of the lateral bit of your brain is supplied by the MCA. And imagine if you knock off that MCA, you're knocking off a huge portion of your brain. And then medially, you've got your ACA that's covering most of it. And then posterior is pretty explanatory, is, is supplying the posterior aspects of the brain, um, as well as a bit of your cerebellum and your midbrain. Okay. Then moving pretty quickly on to how do we classify strokes according to that arterial supply? We have two ways. We can first classify them into whether it's an ischemic or a hemorrhagic stroke, as we spoke about in the question before. Ischemics are usually cardiogenic emboli or um, atherosclerotic in nature. But you also have your small penetrating lacuna strokes, which is tiny, 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 um, as well as cryptogenic. Cryptogenic strokes are the ones where we're not really sure what's caused the stroke. So it could be, for example, in a patient who has AF, but then they also have um, a PFO so or a PDA, so the blood clot that's forming in one atria is able to transfer to the other atria and then up to the brain. That's usually the explanation, but there are other vasculitic patients or um, uh, patients with comorbidities that can predispose them to being coagulopathic. So cryptogenic is, is just strokes where you're not really sure what's happened. Um, and then cardiogenic, your lacuna and your large artery thrombosis are the more common types. Then you have hemorrhagic on the other side, which are a lot less common. Um, and they're probably the more severe ones. So a subarachnoid hemorrhage, for example, uh, that classically presents as your thunderclap headache and intracerebral hemorrhages, which can um, also present with pretty bad headaches and neurological deficits, but they're not as bad as subarach. And these are the distribution. 80% of your strokes that come in will be ischemic in nature. And then the rest 20% will be hemorrhagic, only 5% of which would be subarachnoid in nature, the rest being intracerebral. And as I said earlier, as you can see on the left, the ischemic nature um, shows up darker. So the ischemic tissue over here is darker compared to the normal brain tissue. That's a pretty large territory of stroke over here. And then in the middle, we can see hemorrhagic. So the blood shows up much lighter, almost white. And that's how you can differentiate between the two. On the far right, you've got a subarach, which is always a bit harder to see on CT, but you can see that it follows through the little fissures of the brain within the, um, within the arachnoid mater. So here, and then over here, and then posteriorly as well, that's the subarach bleed. Okay. 
Now, the Bamford stroke classification, it's quite difficult to get your head around because there's a lot to um, remember. And unfortunately, it's just one of those things that in medical school, you're gonna have to try and memorize. The way I like to do it is to simplify it and to think of the different regions of the brain that are responsible for what. So if we start with posterior actually, because I find that the easiest um, to think about, you only need one symptom or one thing to pop off from your posterior function. So think of the brain and think of the cerebellum. What does the cell, what's the cerebellum responsible for? It's responsible for your balance. It's responsible for your eye movements and your eye and your vision. It's responsible for your proprioception and how you walk and your gait. And then also think about how your nerve fibers in the brain come out of the brain through the posterior um, region. And so if you've got bilateral deficits, it's going to be posterior because that's where your um, upper motor neurons are coming down to become your lower motor neurons, all right? So any one of the posterior functions popping off will point you towards having a posterior circulation stroke. That's not very difficult to wrap your head around. Then if we move to lacuna as well, simple in the sense that you only need one of the following, either pure sensory. So if you have a patient who comes in and says, oh, I've got a complete loss of sensation in my, in my lower left arm, and that's the only symptom they have, only that odd sensation, then you're thinking, all right, this isn't probably, it's probably not a huge stroke, it's probably just one of those lacuna vessels that's been hit. Um, also, if it's just purely motor, if they have a sensory motor aspect, but it's just one um, sensory motor aspect, and if they only have ataxic hemiparesis, then you're thinking lacuna. Jilly? Oh, sorry, there's questions I haven't seen. Would a subarach follow the course of the ventricles on the scan? And Julie's answered, thank you. Yes, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily see it um, in the ventricles, no, because you can get intraventricular hemorrhages that will show up in the ventricles, but otherwise the ventricles are pretty spared from um, bleeding out, outside of them in the rest of the brain. But yes, coming back to the anterior side of things now, the way to differentiate between a anterior, total anterior and a partial anterior is just by the number of symptoms. So let's think of the worst severity, a total anterior circulation stroke. That's where you've blocked off um, completely your anterior cerebral artery, will have unilateral weakness, of the face, arm, and leg. You'll have homonymous hemianopia, which is when you can only see half. And you'll have a deficit of higher cerebral um, function. So speech deficits, uh, visual spatial deficits, where you're unable to sort of tell where you are. You have memory issues. Um, and this is just another slide to show that. So that in the middle is what homonymous hemianopia would look like for a patient where they can't see half of the visual field. So if you have three of these, you've knocked off your total anterior circulation, that's a tax. Whereas if you only have two of these, it's partial. All right, so that's the only difference between the two. Any questions so far? I know that's a lot of information and it's kind of difficult to remember. No. Okay, good. So tax has three, tax has two, and then for a posterior circulation stroke, you only need one of these. All right. Mm. 
Now we'll move on to the treatment of strokes. Because um, I'm in the UK, we're following the NICE guidelines, okay? So these are treatments of strokes within the UK. America is pretty much the same, although their timelines are slightly different for when you can or can't give certain treatments. All right, but this, for the sake of this talk, we're following the NICE guidelines. So what is, a, this is kind of a giveaway question because we've already seen quite a few, but what's the first line choice of imaging? Great, yes. It's a CT head without contrast. This is quite important. So a CT is gonna rule out a hemorrhagic stroke. And the pictures previously, I did show you what a CT would look like with an ischemic stroke. However, actually in ED, a lot of patients who come in with neurological signs don't always have um, imaging findings. So an ischemic stroke, does not always show up on a CT head, but the point of getting a CT head is to rule out a hemorrhagic stroke because the two are treated very differently, um, as we'll come on to later. And the reason why you want it without contrast, uh, can anyone tell me why? As opposed to with contrast? Yeah, exactly. So, um, Carl, you, you are going in the right direction in the sense that because we're only using this to rule out a hemorrhage, we don't want to be confused by what is blood and what is what is normal blood and what is hemorrhagic blood. So we want no contrast. We just want to see what this what the head looks like um, without any enhancing agents. OK, because contrast and blood can be confused. So a CT head without contrast, only to rule out hemorrhage, not because you can see ischemia on a CT, all right? Now, the treatment of stroke, an ischemic stroke, uh, this is important, it's only an ischemic stroke we're talking about here, is all dependent on the timing. So if a patient comes in with less than four hours, uh, from the onset of their symptoms, then we're thinking thrombolysis uh, with um, a medical agent called alteplase and thrombectomy. Okay, so you would obviously call the stroke reg, tell them about the patient, um, and then they would be the ones to decide. But ultimately, the rules are if they come in almost immediately within four hours, they're going to be thrombolyzed and they're going to go for a thrombectomy with the neurosurgeons. If there's a bit of blur and they're presenting, let's say, about five hours, anywhere between four and six, you are thinking of thrombectomy. If they're greater than six hours, then now again the lines are kind of blurred and you'd have to get stroke input you'd have to get an mri which is more um, definitive to locate where this stroke is coming from the location of the infarct and whether that would be amenable to thrombectomy or not and then unfortunately in the cases where patients are presenting over 24 hours or if the thrombectomy is not possible then we're thinking just simply aspirin 300 milligrams once a day okay so your thrombolysis cutoff is four hours and as i said earlier this timing differs in different places of the world so depending on where you are always check your um guidelines okay so in the uk it's less than four but in the us it's less than three and then i know um parts of asia they have actually more time, the window's greater to give alteplase. Now, this is only for ischemic strokes. In the context of a hemorrhagic stroke, 
you want to do an immediate neurosurgical re referral um, and see if they can take them for a craniotomy to try and drain out this blood, okay? But because ischemic strokes, 80% of them are ischemic, this is important to memorize these timelines for ischemic strokes, okay? And I think everybody sort of understands the difference between thrombolysis and thrombectomy, right? If there's any questions, please just pop them in the chat. Now, thrombolysis, what's the dose for it? A bit of a tricky question. Any takers? Oh, we've got A, B, and C. So, Rishab, you're correct. It's 0 0.9 mg per kg. Okay, and it's given as a 10% bolus over one minute. Oh, someone's microphone's on. If you don't mind, everybody, please go on mute. Um, yes, so 10% of it is given in the first minute, so very quickly, and then the remaining 90% is over an hour. So effectively, you thrombolize someone within an hour, and then you check, you examine them, you resend them for a CT and check um, whether they need thrombectomy or not. In the case that the patient develops a severe headache or their blood pressure skyrockets or they become nauseous and start vomiting you want to stop that infusion immediately because it could be that this person has gone from an ischemic stroke to hemorrhagic all right so when you're giving thrombolysis you're obviously making the blood thinner you're increasing their bleeding risk so if they develop symptoms of a intracranial hemorrhage stop that infusion immediately and send them for a repeat ct scan Following thrombolysis, so after you've given them that one hour treatment, you want to monitor them quite closely um, over 24 hours. They'll be on a stroke ward and you need to um, specifically observe them with the stroke thrombolysis observation chart. You need to hold all other antiplatelets or anticoagulation for 24 hours and just avoid any sort of actual interventions for 24 hours because you need that um, brain, the swelling and the edema to calm down and you want to give the brain time to heal as much as possible, all right? Also, NG tube insertions can be a little difficult in stroke patients um, because, they're, because of their reduced GCS. Um, and they may have aspiration risks, but you, the risk benefit of inserting is you want to hold off for 24 hours, okay? Because the risk of worsening is greater than the risk of hemorrhage. Sorry, aspiration. Then, secondary prevention. Uh, so you, once you've given your thrombolysis and your patient's stabilized, you'll need to continue aspirin for two weeks, okay? After a patient's had a stroke, they will actually need antiplatelet treatment for life, but for the first two weeks, you give them aspirin, and then the first line after those two weeks is clopidogrel. So you'd switch them from aspirin on to clopidogrel. All stroke patients need to be offered a statin as well, regardless of whether they have hypercholesterolemia or not. Um, that's obviously risk stratification and you want to prevent any sort of atherosclerotic disease, even if their cholesterol levels are fine. All stroke patients also need to have a carotid ultrasound, and that's looking for any problematic vessels or any sclerotic vessels that are at risk of throwing off any um, emboli or further future stroke risk. Okay, so 
antiplatelets for life, a statin for life, as well as some further investigations to try and modify risks for future strokes. Now we have some MCQs and that's the end of a very brief overall general talk on strokes okay so as i said earlier please have a go at these mcqs um, and if you've got any further questions let me know on the chat box so an 80 year old lady is brought to ed by her son with difficulty speaking and change in her vision she reports she can only see the right half of her visual field She's taken for an urgent CT scan, which confirms an ischemic stroke. But what kind of stroke do you suspect she has had, according to the Bamford classification? Okay, let's get some more answers in there. Yep, okay, so Anas and iPad, well done. That's correct, she's had a partial anterior circulation stroke. The reason being is because she's got two out of the three symptoms so she that we were talking about for anterior circulation. So she has Difficulty speaking, which is one of the higher cerebral function, and she's got homonymous hemianopia. So she's got two out of the three, which means it's not total, but it is partial. All right. The reason why it's not a posterior circulation stroke um, is because, as mentioned earlier, she's not got any of the posterior symptoms. And the lacuna would mostly present with either sensory or motor changes. Okay, so a 64 year old man describes, I can't read this, but I know the question, describes three episodes of double vision, vertigo and sudden onset weakness on the right side of his face and arm in the last week. Each attack, only lasted around 10 minutes and was present with a dull headache. He presented to ED after the third episode where his, where his symptoms were still persisting. He was admitted to the stroke unit and diagnosed with a posterior circulation stroke. For how long is he not allowed to drive for? Okay, so we've got two people saying B. I'm going to give people some more time. Some people saying E as well. Mm -hmm. Any more for any more? So actually, more people are saying E. Okay, so DVLA, which is the um, authorities for driving in the UK actually say that after a stroke, you're not allowed to drive for three months. But I see how this question is kind of confusing because obviously you need your symptoms to resolve. However, let's assume that in this case, he's been treated for his posterior circulation, his symptoms have resolved, let's say a week after his admission, the cutoff or the, uh, the absolute minimum amount of time, according to the DVLA, for how long you can drive after a stroke is three months. And med schools love DVLA guidance, post-stroke and in epilepsy. So make sure you know these timelines. And yes, I'm sorry for the slightly confusion, confusing question. Of course it would be um, after his symptoms resolve, but assuming that they do pretty quickly, you need at least three months before you're legally allowed to drive after a stroke.
Is it per institutional policy in stroke management? Yes, so it is, but I think the UK is following the best guidance. So the DVLA is, is following guidance as per um, the literature. So it is essentially institutional policy, yes, but in the UK, that's the DVLA. A 75 year old man develops sudden onset left sided weakness this morning and was brought to ED by his wife in the afternoon. His past medical history includes type 2 diabetes, hypertension and glaucoma. On examination, you find he has reduced power, so 4 out of 5 on the left side, with no other abnormal examination findings. He's alert and he's orientated. MRI shows a right thalamic infarct. What is the next best step in his management? Okay, so think about timelines here, all right? We've said that his weakness started in the morning when he woke up, let's imagine, but he's only been brought to ED in the afternoon. So at this stage, we're out of the thrombolysis window. Any more? Yes, exactly. Mr. iPad. <laughs> so we're out of the thrombolysis window. We can't give him any alter plays. We also can't throm um, take him for thrombectomy. So our only option really is to start him on the 300 milligrams of aspirin because he's out of the four hour and six hour window. Okay. Now for those who've said anticoagulation, it's a bit of a trick or a bit of a mean um, option because I assume you're meaning thrombolysis when you answer A instead of actually anticoagulation because thrombolysis is different to anticoagulation and in strokes there's no um, role for anticoagulants such as a DOAC or warfarin. Um, you don't give anticoagulation in strokes, it's, it's thrombolysis with alteplase and then antiplatelets. Okay. Ambulatory ECG monitoring, well, that would be important in a patient who also had AF. Okay. And then the clopidogrel is what you give after two weeks of aspirin. All right. Now, think carefully about this question again, okay? It's a bit of a trick. 65 year old woman develops sudden inability to speak properly while she was talking to her husband. She was brought to the hospital immediately. Her past medical history includes hypertension and osteoarthritis for which she's on bendroflumethiazide and PRN codeine. On examination, she has word finding difficulties, but she's otherwise completely normal. Her blood pressure is 190 over 100. What's the next best step in her management? B. Let's wait for some more answers. Okay, so another person saying alter plays. Any more? Okay, another person saying B. We've got an overwhelming majority here. Any more? Okay, so in this lady, 
I agree that she's presented almost immediately to hospital. So we probably are in the window of four hours for thrombolysis. However, she has a contraindication, which is her blood pressure. So we need to bring down the blood pressure before giving alteplase. So this is probably the one and only contraindication to thrombolizing a patient is if their systolic is above 185. So I added in this question specifically so that we could talk about this because as expected, we most people think we could should go straight to alteplase and straight to thrombolysis. However, her blood pressure is too high. And the reason why that's an issue is if you thrombolize someone with that blood pressure, you're increasing their risk of hemorrhaging. Okay, so you really need to bring that blood pressure down to below 185 before you can thrombolize. So here we'd give her an antihypertensive before the altar plays. But well done to everyone who recognized that this lady is fit for thrombolysis otherwise. Okay. It was a trick question. <laughs> now, Another question that we haven't spoken about, but is very important to know. An 82 year old man presents to ED with right-sided hemiparesis and hemianopia. He's already been given 300 milligrams of aspirin after his CT confirmed an ischemic stroke. During his hospital admission after the stroke, he's found to be in paroxysmal AF with a CHADVASC score of four. Now, when can we start anticoagulating this man after a stroke? So he's already had the antiplatelet treatment, but he's also got AF. So he needs anticoagulation as well. We spoke about this a little earlier that with strokes, you have the risk of hemorrhage. So you want to avoid anticoagulants, but with his AF, he does need to be on one. What is the window of time after which you can start? After, okay, good. So iPad and Rishab, well done. The answer is after two weeks. So in ischemic strokes, there is a window of hemorrhagic transformation risk. That window is two weeks. So the theory behind it is that if you've got um, a thrombus that's blocking off your blood supply and causing you to have an ischemic stroke, that can transform to a hemorrhagic stroke where the blood vessel or the blockage has caused up such a buildup that then the vessel actually bursts and hemorrhages. That risk is very high for two weeks. And that's why you wouldn't anticoagulate a patient with AF and a stroke for two weeks. But after that window, you can. This is also a very common um, med school final question about the hemorrhagic transformation window of ischemic strokes. Okay, so remember two weeks. I think that's our last question. So thank you very much for coming to the talk today. And thank you for bridging, to Bridging the Gap and Gillian Gain for asking me to talk. If anybody's got any questions, you can put them on the chat or you could email me as well. My email's down below um, and I'm happy for people to message me or um, email with any questions at all. Also, please fill in the feedback with the QR code that's right there on the screen. Thank you so much, Janvi, for doing this talk for us. I know you have a really busy oh. schedule, so no thank problem. you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time out to do this for us. Uh, I hope you guys found it useful, and it would be really, really useful for us if we, if as many people as possible can fill in the feedback form, and you will also get a copy of the slides. Uh, and also a certificate of attendance um, and 
Yeah, there's a lot of thank yous coming in. You're so welcome, guys. Thank you for coming. We'll just stick around for a few minutes, just in case if anyone has um, any questions. Um,